G'day everyone, Dicko here with another kick-ass walkthrough. In this video, I am going to show you how to animate a 3D ball in Blender. And despite that I'm doing it in Blender, you can probably try this exact method in any other software. This is more or less an extension of the previous video, but you know, doing it in 3D instead of 2D. That being said, doing a ball bounce is still ultra, ultra important to learn, I reckon, and uh, it is a fundamental skill to understand when it comes to animating in 3D as well. Not only because it's, well, firstly, fairly simple to do and practice with, but a lot of the movements you end up making in 3D are largely based of broad movements that you can create with a ball. And of course, there's plenty of other new stuff to talk about when it comes to animating a ball, at least in 3D. Stuff like how the rig works, what to consider, how to counter animate, how to uh, squash and stretch, how to rotate the ball effectively, where to place the ball, all kinds of stuff comes into play when you are no longer drawing the thing and you need to actually build a rig that suits that kind of animation. And that brings me to the rig itself. And as you can see, the amount of controls that you need to create an effective ball rig is more than you may think, because there's a lot of elements that come into play when you need to animate a ball effectively, especially one that's cartoony. So starting with the base control, this one is called the global control. And it's basically the uh, control that you use to place the ball wherever you want in your scene. It's sort of the starting point for everything else. You don't necessarily animate with this control, you merely use it as a starting point. So you set up your scale, you can set up your location, you can set up where the ball needs to be for any given point at the start of the animation. Moving from there, we have the center of gravity control or COG or COG. And that's the red control in the middle. And that one is used for actually animating location in my case. This is how I use it. But basically I use it to create the underlying bounce movement for the rig itself. Again, and over there you can see that the rotation is actually switched off because I don't actually use this for actually animating the ball rotating. It's merely for animating location itself. The blue control then is actually our first rotational control. So this rotational control allows us to rotate the direction of the squash and stretch. That's basically all I use it for again. It's a hierarchical system here. Following that, we have our actual squash and stretch control. So from the top and bottom of that ball, this will allow us to squash and stretch the ball in any direction we want. It can even like bend it, twist it a little bit if you wanted to as well, which is really, really cool. Now, like I said, this is a hierarchical system. So the blue control will control the, um, the squash and stretch as well. So you can actually redirect the squash and stretch in any direction you want, but it comes at a cost because of the way it's set up, if I try to rotate that ball from that parent control, you can see it's pivoting from the, not the center of the ball, but from the origin point of that control, which is a bit of a pain. So that's where the yellow control comes in and that's our master rotational control for the ball itself. And this allows us to rotate the ball in any direction, even if it's stretched, which is really, really important because you can stretch a ball in any direction. You can squash it in any direction and you can rotate it in any direction. So basically what this allows us to have is complete control over the direction of the squash and stretch, complete control over the rotation of the ball. And then we can also compensate or do some counter animation if we need to, if you want to have the squash and stretch face a certain direction, but the ball face another direction, if that makes sense. We don't really touch on that in this animation today because the ball bounce is quite simple but if you need to do it, you can. So as you can see here, we can counter animate the um, rotation and then have the squash and stretch work in any direction we want. You just, be con you just gotta be conscious of which way and which controls you're rotating and which controls you're stretch stretching and which controls you are you know, moving around. So that's why we have this little breakdown. And of course, if you like the look of this rig, feel free to download it by signing up to my Patreon where you will have access to not just this rig, but the working files to this animation video, and then also ad free recordings as well. So this video is available ad free on Patreon, along with all my other videos that I've published in the last few months, along with their working files as well. So feel free to check that out. Okay, now that that preamble is out the way, let's jump into the ball bounce itself. So my viewport is set up as the following. On the right side, I have my animation window where I'm gonna animate on. My left side is my camera view without any overlays turned on. 
The bottom left is my timeline and the bottom right is my graph editor. So firstly, I'm gonna block out the lateral movement of the ball. So where it's gonna go from point A to point B. I'm gonna add a single keyframe to the start of my animation on the location. Just push I, add a key, location keyframe. And then I'm gonna set that keyframe to linear by pushing T and then clicking on linear. That will help remove any easing in the animation. So I don't wanna have it accelerate or decelerate at this point. I just wanna have it completely linear at this time. Then I'm gonna scroll forward in my timeline to around 80, 85 frames, 75 frames, and just place another keyframe at the end of my animation. So again, pushing I on the keyboard, or you can turn on automatic keyframing. In this case, I'm gonna push on automatic keyframing. You'll see in the graph editor, a single green, in this case, green line that is linear. There's no curves on that line. So basically it's super robotic movement because we want constant movement at this point in time. The ball is going to be moving at a relatively constant pace, at least at the moment. So here's what the graph will look like if you haven't turned on linear animation on those keyframes. So in this case, I'm moving it back to the default. You'll see that the line is curved. It's got a Bezier curve and the, and the acceleration and deceleration is really present in that movement. But that's not something that you want if you wanna have a nice powerful ball bounce, at least at the start of the thing. You want it to sort of slow down at the end, but for now we want it to like launch off with a lot of power. All right. I'm gonna move the first keyframe a few frames forward. I'm gonna move it about 10 frames forward at this point because what I wanna do is add some buildup to that bounce. I'm gonna add a little bit of personality to that bounce. Like the previous video, we're gonna have the ball squash down and then launch itself off up the ground and then go into the bounce after that. That's why I've added a hold frame. They call it a hold frame between zero and 10 to allow myself to add that squash and stretch before the ball launches off. Next thing I'm gonna do is right click on that control and select create motion paths because that will allow us to visualize that path in the viewport because what I'm gonna do now is work out my bounces. And unlike in 2D where you just draw an arc to see where it's going, you can't really do that in 3D unless you use the grease pencil as a blocking stage. You can go ahead and do that if you want to, but if you wanna just visualize it with the tools that you have in Blender, just go ahead and do that. Add a motion path. Now my bounces are gonna start with a sort of eight frame arc. So it will reach the top of the arc at eight frames and then back down on the ground another eight frames later. That's my current pattern at the moment. So I'm going ahead and adding my arcs by basically moving along the timeline every eight frames or so, adding my arc, moving the ball up, it will automatically keyframe. I'm not adding rotation by the way, no rotation. And just working out the bounces one by one. And each bounce, of course, should be a little bit less than the last one in terms of height and in terms of distance. So it really depends on what kind of ball bounce you're going for, how much personality you're trying to give to that ball bounce, how realistic you want it to be. It's really up to you. So in my case, I'm adding, a, I think I'm going to add like five ball bounces here. But generally speaking, I'm roughing out my bounces. And even now I can tell that like one bounce is wider than the other when it shouldn't be. The second bounce is wider, or at least appears to be wider. But... At this point, I'm not too um, uh, I'm not too fussy about it. So yeah, just go ahead and work out your bounces. I'm gonna have about five. So going down the line, I'm literally just gonna move the ball along the timeline, keyframe where I need to keyframe, adjust where I need to adjust, and then just try and get a nice, clean, consistent bounce that reduces in energy with every bounce. I'm also keeping in mind, if you look at the graph editor on the bottom right, I'm trying to keep the uh, location of the movement, so the the, um, the movement relatively consistent. So I don't want to have it go completely short and then completely long, like so, like a, a steep steep line and then a, a flat line, because that, that means that the the speed of the ball bounce is moving or changing drastically over time. So I'm trying to keep it relatively consistent. So after a little fiddling around, you should have something that looks kind of like what I've got here. Now, if you need to um, reset your motion paths, go ahead and do that. Cause sometimes Blender doesn't update them properly, especially if you're cutting and pasting keyframes, it won't update the motion paths automatically. So every now and then right click, update those motion paths. You can also do it on the bottom right of the um, property editor as well. If you can see the update paths button on the bottom right, you can do it there too. But in the end, you should have something that looks kind of like what I've got here, where the bounces are reducing in energy 
uh, reducing in the amount of keyframes they need to get over the bounce as well. So you can see that the ball bounces are getting shorter and shorter and shorter in both time and in space. And of course, there's no hard and fast rules here. It's really about what you find appealing and what you think looks correct. Obviously, the best thing I can say is just find reference if you're getting lost. So find some reference to a ball that you think has the right momentum that you like. Okay, once I've done that, I'm actually going to delete some keyframes on the, in this case, it's the Y location. So I'm cleaning up some motion already so I can get a nice clean movement along my ball bounce. And you can see it actually changes the way that the ball bounce behaves if I update those motion paths. So again, you gotta be conscious of the changes you make along the way, but I really just wanted to make sure that the, the momentum was consistent. So I'm trying to keep it relatively clean. Maybe as it slows down, or get shorter in distance that the ball would slow down as well. So I can make those adjustments. But generally speaking, I'm trying to keep it consistent. Especially considering that in the future, soon I wanna add a few hold frames to allow myself to incorporate some squash and stretch on the impacts of those ball bounces. And I can't really do that when I have so much messy keyframes around. So every now and then go ahead and clean up your um, keyframes if you have to. Now the last thing I'm gonna do with that location is actually bezier or smooth out or decelerate the ball at the end of the momentum so you can see here that i'm adding a little bit of a curve at the end there so the ball can actually slow down after it stops bouncing because i want it to decelerate once the friction takes hold and things start to smooth out so you can do that by adding a bezier curve to both the previous keyframe that i've selected now and the last keyframe that allows us to have the ball after it stops bouncing as you can see it's going pretty consistently here it will come to a soft stop so adding those beziers back will really help and for the uninformed that is t on the keyboard to change the linear to bezier on keyframes okay the next thing i'm going to do is actually add a hold frame in between each impact to allow me to add some squash and stretch so the way i'm going to do that is basically select the control that i've been using for um, this entire time select the keyframe that i've landed on copy it move one frame forward and paste it in and because I've added that extra hold in there, I need to shift the entire set of animation forward from that keyframe onwards. So I'm gonna select everything after that keyframe and move it one frame forward by pushing G and one. Do the same thing along the entire animation. So you wanna have a little hold on the impact of that animation, G and one with the rest of the keyframes. And you'll get this sort of stepped like nature to the, um, the motion. Select the keyframe copy it G and one and you can see the step come in shift the animation forward and so on and so forth now depending on the on the kind of ball bounce you're going for this is going to add a little bit more cartoony ball bounce you may not need to do this you may just be happy with the straight up hold uh, straight up bounces impact launches right off the ground so this is really an optional thing you can add it's completely up to you, but I'm going to add a little bit to give it a little bit more character. So yeah, hold frame, G plus one, move it forward. And what you get is that the ball almost looks like it sticks on the ground for a couple of frames. And it's amazing how just one extra frame of animation can change the look of something completely and utterly. It's really, really interesting when you think about that. Now, looking back at this video, I can already see that there's a few little mistakes, at least on the Y, the green um, graph. Uh, basically, there's no hold frames in what I've got there. Uh, it should look like a little bit like a, a sloping step. As you can see, some have it, some don't. Um, if you're going with this method, you want to have it sort of step on each impact. Anyway, that's something we can fix in the future. But for now, what we're going to do now is spline our bounce. So temporarily in the graph editor, I've hidden away everything except the Z location or Z location. Press T on my keyboard and then select Bezier. And what will that do? It will actually spline out our bounce across the entire animation and what we get is like this sine wave like animation and this is kind of what we want but not quite what we want is the impacts on the bottom of the bounces to all hit linearly so without any deceleration so how we can do that is by pushing v on our keyboard and selecting vector and what that will do it will basically create that bounce like effect where the arcs are nice and sharp. They'll decelerate at the top because of that bezier slowing down those keyframes, but on the impacts at least, they will stay put and they will stick to the ground nicely. 
and you get this really nice natural arc. Now, if you want to get more of a cartoony motion going on now, we can select the top keyframes on those arcs and scale them outwards a little bit with those bezier handles. And that will allow us to get a wider arc on that bounce. You can see the keyframes are closer at the top of that bounce than they are when they start to fall down to the ground. And what we end up getting is this really um, nice natural arc of motion across those bounces. So go ahead and fix those up according to whatever appeal that you want to give that ball bounce is completely up to you how you want to do that um, i'm going with this and i think that will work quite nicely so you can see here it's starting to look like a pretty nice bounce pretty quickly just because of that slight changes in the bezier curves and how we adjust those keyframes the keyframes we haven't moved we haven't uh, done anything to them we haven't changed any values we've just ch changed the way that blender interpolates how to get from point a to point b to point c to point d etc 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 now once you've done that we can bring back all of our keyframes and then start to see where the thing what we need to clean up in my case i'm going to go ahead and clean up my y channel so you can see here that the, the ball is sliding between my holds so what i'm doing i'm basically copying and pasting my frames again at least on the y axis so i can get a nice hold on the motion so i've noticed that mistake now I'm going through and just making sure that it looks nice and neat. So where I want those holds to be, I'm adding those holds. Again, this is completely up to you to do. I'm adding the holds because I want to add some squash and stretch. And the only way I can add some squash and stretch that looks natural is if the ball stays on the ground long enough so the eye can register it. So adding that hold in between those different impacts. So what we have is this sort of like stepped like decline, which is kind of cool. And then I'm going ahead and just cleaning up my um, my curves on that graph editor. Again, as a 3D animator, you're spending more time in the graph editor than you are in the viewport half the time. So um, that's just the nature of doing it in 3D. And as you can see, the ball bounce is looking way, way more natural at this point. Um, because we did that planning, we blocked out those um, our bounces early on without the distraction of um, the arcs, without the distraction of acceleration, deceleration. We can now add that in at a at, in a pinch basically on every single frame not a problem after that all right once i've done that we can now try to animate the rotation i'm going to go with the animation of the rotation starting from week uh point 10 and then going to frame 100 and i'm just going to randomly uh, uh rotate the ball along in this case the x-axis so i feel like there's enough rotation in the um ball bounce now this could take a little bit of trial and error in my case i was really lucky in that i kind of guessed it it felt natural the amount of rotation felt natural in the first attempt so this was about 10,000 or 1080 degrees of rotation and it felt really natural when it came to a stop so i'm actually really happy with that but in your case you may need to tweak it according to how far you want that ball to bounce how far it's traveled over time and how it's slowing down so it's really up to you how it looks and how it feels. In my case, I think it feels really, really nice. So I'm gonna keep it as is. Now you've done the rotation with that yellow control, we can now start to do the squash and stretch. So I'm gonna go ahead and keyframe that squash and stretch first with the location control. Um, one keyframe on frame one with its default pose. And then I'm gonna add my squash and stretch. So I'm gonna add a little bit of anticipation up in my case, just a little bit to make it feel like it's pulling back before it squishes down. And then I'm gonna add some real squash in the um, the moment just before it launches off the uh, ground. So playing with that squash and stretch is completely up to you and what kind of aesthetic you want for your animation. So I'm gonna add a little bit of bunk, 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 a little bit of squash and stretch and it adds so much more personality to that ball bounce, especially since the ball is starting from nowhere. We need to add that personality into it. Now, if this was a natural ball bounce, the ball would have already been moving at this point or would have been knocked by something to allow it to start bouncing. In this case, the ball has almost got its own consciousness, in which case I want it to launch off on its own volition. So that's where we have to build up that energy, add that squash and stretch in the motion. Okay, so I'm gonna do all of the impacts first and then I'm gonna do the arcs later. So the impact for this one, 
I'm going to make sure that the direction of the squash and stretch is appropriate to the arc starting in. So I'm going to firstly keyframe my two points where the impacts are. In the first one, I'm going to move that, that squash and stretch down a little bit and sort of rotate just a little bit. And then in the second impact frame, I'm going to really squish it down really flat and really makes that feel boonk, like there's uh, some serious uh, stretch going on um, or squash going on. Now, once the ball leaves the um, the area or leaves the ground, you want that ball to rebound pretty quickly. So in this case, I've basically reset the pose on the squash and stretch controls by pushing Alt G, Alt R. So Alt G, Alt R on the keyboard will help you reset those poses. And what we get is this really nice little squash effect in the, um, the impact. Now, note that with every impact, the squash and stretch should be less. It should be less on every impact, slightly less on each bounce. As the ball runs out of energy, it should not be building up energy in the squash and stretch. It should, it should not be being affected as much by the impact of the, um, the fall. All right, so it should be less and less and less until you get to maybe the last, second to last or last animation uh, frame uh, of the bounces, uh, in which case there's almost none or none at all, no squash and stretch at all. So again, just follow the arcs as a guide, the, um, the motion path as a guide to how to sort of structure that squash and stretch, and then um, just go through and keyframe a lot of it. Just remember that you need to reset the pose on the parts where there is no squash, all right? So make sure you reset just before and just after the poses to get a nice clean squash that is gone by the time the ball leaves the ground. Okay, once you've got those impacts done, we can start to work on the stretch. And that's actually pretty fun to do because um, you want to make it very quick and very impactful. So basically, as soon as the, the ball leaves the ground, the next frame should have quite a lot of stretch. So the ball just literally launches from a squash to a stretch um, pose within a matter of a frame or two. And then as it's going along the arc, use the arcs as a guide to judge the squash and stretch. So you can see here that as the ball starts to round up around the um, the uh, the top of the arcs, I'm trying to minimize the stretch. So I'm making the stretch smaller, but I'm also being very conscious not to overextend the ball stretch so that it's higher than the ball at its highest point at the top of the arc. So you need to be really conscious of that. So make sure the ball or the arcs of the um, the stretch are following the arcs of the motion of the ball itself. And that's the only way it will start to feel natural. Otherwise, if the, the stretch is at the wrong angle, facing the wrong angle of um, the motion, it looks really weird. It almost turns into like a football shape bouncing rather than a, uh, a ball that's just being stretched. So you wanna be very conscious of the direction of the stretch, all right? And the stretch can be either subtle or it can be very, very intense. So depending on how cartoony you want that motion to be, it's really up to you how much stretch you put into it. So similarly, once we get to the ground, just before the ground, we hit the ground, I'm going to add a lot of stretch into that ball just before it starts to get squashed. So it's literally a matter of frames before it goes from stretched to squished. And you can see here that I've overlapped it a little bit. The bottom squash and stretch control now needs to be um, keyframed to be flat on the ground. So making sure I reset that a little bit, control uh, Alt G in this case, so it stays stuck on the ground. And you can see just one frame stretch, one frame squash, and then back into a regular ball. So again, it's really up to you how far you take it and how far you want to make it, it how far you want to express the squash and stretch in your animation. Like I said, there are no rules here merely what you want. So what kind of appeal do you want to inject into your animation is your judgment call, not mine. But what I can say is that when you are working on these um, extra elements that you are following um, logical paths, I guess you can say. So um, for instance there, you can see the ball, the stretching of the ball suddenly goes linear. You want to have to redirect that a little bit. 
for instance, redirect that a little bit so that the, um, the direction of that stretch looks natural. If, it, if I hadn't have fixed that, it would look really, really strange. So again, going through and just cleaning things up and making sure that the arcs are in line with the arcs of motion. The arcs of the squash and stretch are in line with the arcs of motion. So that being said, just go ahead and start to inject your squash and stretch across your ball bounce and being conscious to reduce that squash and stretch over the course of that ball bounce as it descends or reduces in energy toward the end of the ball bounce. So by the end of the ball bounce, as I said before with the squash, same with the stretch, don't add too much stretch in the latter half of the ball bounce because it just, just look really, really fucked. So um, minimize it on each bounce, make it smaller on each bounce until eventually it's basically gonna stay as a sphere, a spherical ball on the last couple bounces. And if you have to, don't be afraid to polish up along the way. Of course, um, if you start basic and then start to add complexity, it will be a lot easier to maintain a polished state faster. If you find that you're starting to lose control of all the keyframes and things looking really wonky, you'll probably be better off just deleting a lot of it and then starting over and cleaning things up again. That's generally what happens when you have to sort of when you feel overwhelmed. It's better to start removing keyframes rather than adding new ones. So once you've done all that, we're at the end game here. Just add a few lights, add some backgrounds, add some color, and you're good to go. And what you should have is a nice cartoony, playful ball bounce that can be done in around half an hour to an hour's worth of your time. And if you start to practice a little bit more and do it more often, it gets easier and easier and easier. So for me, this one took around half an hour to animate. Um, and like any animator, I can go back to this in a few days time and look at it and say, oh, there's things that need to be cleaned up. Things look a bit wrong. Maybe one bounce looks faster than the other when it shouldn't. Those are natural things to think about. And it's obvious that every animator does this. Don't be discouraged if you start thinking that way. It only means that you're getting better at observing these things over time. The more you see these things happen, the better the animator you will become. The more you can notice these problems, the better your animation will be. So you can fix them. So don't be discouraged if the first ball bounce looks like shit because the next one is gonna look even better. So one last little tip I wanna show you is if you want to turn it into a um, stop motion like effect, what you can do is open up the action editor, convert it down to a non-linear animation track and then add a step animation modifier to your animation and that will allow you to get a stop motion like effect sort of like a spider-verse slash wallace and gromit like effect where you basically turn a 24 or 25 animation frame animation into a 12 frame animation a 12 frame per second animation um, you can still edit that animation by the way by pushing um, tab inside of the non-linear animation editor so just select that action and then push tab and then allow you to edit the animation but otherwise, if you want to have a nice clean animation, don't worry about what I'm just showing you there. That's all we need to do. So I hope you like this video. Uh, it's been really fun going through this with you guys. If you want to download the rigs, feel free to sign up for my Patreon. Thank you for those who already have signed up. It's been awesome. And I really appreciate the support. Other than that, all I'm going to say is catches and have fun. Cheers. Now, I haven't had the time to do this before, but I want to thank everyone on Patreon personally in this video. Um, starting from the top, uh, Regina Sanctus, James Hughes, Adalbert Faustinus, M. Connor Lehe, Philippe Garancho, Joe Rodriguez, Kieran Estrada, Peter Hoffman, Josh Erickson, Viati, Dean Armstrong, Paul Fitzsimmons, Rafael Nietzsche Lita, Dylan Vu, The Rewar, Michael Rhodes, Nitu Sebastian, Orange, Sergei Samoylenko, Patrick Pope, Kat Lira, Jan Batbese, Kunshin Lok, Angelina and Sherard, John the Vagabond, Julian Weiss, Thomas Oakley, Lara McLaughlin, Reese McClue, Damo El Diablo, Garrett Wessendorf, Alex Castro, Joseph M. Kuligowski, Bamba Desolate, Emily Gutierrez, Pripyat, Nina, Davius Canini, Salu, Weeps, King Tide 64, Galvanisi, 
Diet Mocha, Vixel Six, Victor, Michelle, Alvisette, Katie Lee D'Souza, Brother Wolf, Meh, and Jerry Hamlet. Jay, Tyler Bell, Christopher Gustav, Elizabeth Bar Status, Najerp, Dan Allen Lompart, John Friesen, Branislav Danik, Lazo Satmari, Pantagorithm, BS, John Trosden, Isaac, David Parkin, Zach Thomas, Revengers85, Breadman, Sarah Pip, Gabriel, Rachel, Murph, Andy Liang, Shirley Lamb, Dr. Zigzag, Jesse Benjamin, Thame Brimall, Trey Briggs, and Kelly Johnson. Anyway, thanks again, and I hope I didn't butcher your names too much. I'm sure I did with this horrible, horrible Aussie accent. Anyway, catch us later. Cheers.